Are you ready for rapid fire? Let's go. So All ready right. for rapid fire. All right. I don't know what you think about these first couple here. I've been I've been kind of excited to, to, to talk oh, about boy. these. I think it's going to be fun. So Irish defensive coordinator Al Golden asked yesterday if he remembers the last time he held an opposing this team to six first downs like his defense did against Purdue last week. Here is Golden's response. I wish I had the audio, but I'm going to read you the transcript. So here's Golden's response to that. Quote, I don't. But it's so long ago now that it's history. I don't really get into the stat part of it. We turned the page fast. We graded it on the way home, woke up Sunday morning, put a couple bullets on, things we did well, things we have to do better, had our staff meeting and moved on. This is an excellent system that awaits in Miami, and it all goes through the most veteran quarterback I've seen in quite some time. I'm sorry. You just can't look backwards. End quote. So, Vince. Al Golden doesn't care about holding Purdue to six first downs, but do you care about holding Purdue to six first downs? I absolutely care because it's my job to care. It's not his job to care. <laughs> That's right. But I'm I'm I am totally cool with his response. I really am. I think it's a fantastic response. He's supposed to turn the page and get ready for the next opponent, and then in the off season you can dwell and you can look back and you can be all excited about what you did. But right now, you're supposed to focus on the next opponent. So I have no problem whatsoever with his response. But as analysts, as people who break down the game, as people who comment on the game, that's our job, right? I absolutely care that they only gave Purdue six first downs. That's a dominating defense. And you hope that they can repeat that type of performance going into this week against Miami, Ohio. So I, yes, I absolutely care because... They gave up too many first downs two weeks ago. Right. They couldn't get off the field two Correct. weeks ago because, you know, every time they were in a situation where they could, Northern Illinois stayed on the field and they kept milking them and, and you know, grinding them a little bit. And I think it took its toll by the end of the game. You know, Purdue punted 10 times <laughs> in that game. They punted yep. the first five times they had the ball in the game and the only reason they didn't punt the first six times they had the ball was because Bubakar Traore had to pick six the sixth time right. they had the ball so like the defense and Al Golden's guys they are doing their job and I absolutely care as well I think it's a fantastic you know stat as much as he doesn't want to look at stats that they made Purdue punt 10 times in yeah. the game 10 times like that's Iowa level, you know, like with even though Iowa's offense is better this year, but last couple of years, that is Iowa level offense right now. Would you like to be a fly on the wall watching Al Golden grind tape? I can only imagine because they obviously took a bus <laughs> down to Purdue. And if he's breaking down the film while on the bus, I can only imagine. He's got his laptop out. You know, it just, <laughs> oh, come on! Like, just, like, getting so, like, frustrated, you know, like that kind of a thing. And, uh-huh. and he didn't really have a whole lot of tape to grind through because there was a heck of a lot of three and outs after the first couple of series. <laughs> True. That was a quick tape to get I through, mean, wasn't it? But I can just, because he's the kind of guy that would dwell on the negative, which I think is fantastic after you basically shut out a team and mm-hmm. beat him by 59 points. Like he, you know, he came up and he got off that bus pissed off about something like that's, <laughs> that's exactly that's right. how I see it. So yeah, the answer to your question is absolutely. I would love to watch it. I just picture Al golden. Like he's going to bed at 2 AM after he's, you know, practicing, he's grinding film all night. And then he's up at 6 AM and he's like drinking his coffee while he's on his treadmill you know, and it's like, you know, it's, he's got his third down game film on and he's, you know, he's got he's it on his more TV. Mad. Yeah, that's right. He's got his visor on and he's got a pencil up, you know, like stuck up in his visor and he's got his notepad out and the whole thing. And, you know, then his wife's like, Al, could you feed the dog before you leave? And he's like, how am I supposed to feed the dog? I got to figure out how I'm going to stop number five on third down. You know, like that's. That's what I see. Go, you know, she's like, oh, Al, you'll figure it out. You know, like that's, <laughs> oh, Al. <laughs> that's how I see. That's how I picture Al Golden's life going. Oh, he's fantastic. He's a slave to the film, you know? <laughs> he's, he's, he's one of those guys that has, like, the mini treadmill at his desk. You know what I mean? At the office. <laughs> right. he's, he has to, like, walk it off, you know, as he's, as he's trying to figure out game film. <laughs> that's right. But the answer is yes. I would love to be a a fly on the wall watching that. So (laughs) 
on that on that note, scale of one to ten, what is your confidence with this fighting Irish defense this season? Oh, it's still pretty high. I mean, it's like an eight, eight and a half, maybe closing on on a nine. It went down obviously after week two against Northern Illinois. I mean, they they could have won that game for Notre Dame as bad as everything else was. They still could have won the game for Notre Dame, right? And so it, it dropped a little bit. They they didn't look good at times in that game. So. But then they come out and they did what they did against Purdue. And it was like, okay, they're back. You know, they played with emotion. They they played with, you know, a little, I believe uh, Brian and I call it a little P and V, a little piss and vinegar. Like they, yeah. <laughs> they, they played with that on Saturday. Yeah. I want to see yeah. that kind of a defense. It's just, just, you know, flying to the football, using their athleticism and their speed, making good tackles in space, like all of those different things. They did all of that on Saturday. Do it again and do it again and do it again and prove that you are an elite defense. And that's the thing. Yeah. I mean, I would put it probably high, you know, high eight pushing nine yeah. right now, because as, as golden said a week ago at this time, look, they, they played okay versus Northern Illinois, but at the end of the day, they didn't play well enough to get the team to the win. Yeah. And they needed to get them the win, you know, like Northern Illinois hit those explosive plays in the first half and specifically Brown hit the explosive yeah. plays in the first half, but they also, like we were talking about, even when they weren't hitting the explosive plays, they still just made you feel uncomfortable, almost like an option offense, you know, just kept kind of moving those sticks a little bit farther than they probably should have after the first contact. And like the yards after contact against Northern Illinois was just nuts. There was none of that. They were just so much more fundamentally yes. sound this past week. And now you look at the fact that they have only allowed – 36 points through three games, 12 points a game right now. And like, it's, it's, I don't think that they, like they played a really good game last week, but I just, I don't think they played their best game. Oh yeah. Yet. And, and that's, what's kind of scary because I think this defense still has so much upside, you know, based on what we've seen so far. Completely agree. I, I we have yet to see the best because nobody's going to give them credit for the way they played against Purdue. You know, Purdue's probably going to be a sub-500 team. they got a tough schedule ahead of them. They're not a great football team, obviously. So they're not going to get a lot of credit for that. They're, they're going to need to shut down team after team after team, and then they'll start getting some credit. Right. So offensive coordinator Mike Denbrock got uh, some comments from him from last night as well. He was asked what he learned about Steve Angeli <laughs> after seeing Angeli get his first game action of the season against Purdue. Last week, what'd you learn about Steve Angeli that you didn't know? Here's the response from Mike Dembrock. Quote, I don't know that I've learned anything in particular that I didn't already know, if that's what your question is. I watched him very intently in the bowl game and paid attention to how he did in live game reps. Watched him all spring, watched him in fall camp. It's all pretty much the same thing that I've seen right along. He's got great leadership. He's got the ability to make some throws that we need to make offensively and did a good job while he was in there, end quote. So that response, Vince, is blank. The perfect response. It's perfect. He Everything he said is 100% accurate. He is a good leader. He's he's a he's a loud leader. You know, he's a vocal leader. He, he is a, he's a good leader. The fact that he said he's got the ability to make some throws. Not the ability to make all the throws. He's got the ability to make some. He's got the ability to make some throws, and he, you know, that we need to make offensively. And he did a good job while he was in there. Those are all true statements. So I think he nailed it. I think he nailed it. I think that's absolutely accurate. Yeah, and Brian and why he is what he is. Yeah, is that's Brian's exact, response, and that's he is exactly who he, what he, he is. Who I thought he was. Yeah, you no, know? no that's more. Exactly no less. what Den Brock said. He's like, I've watched him intently. This is right. who he is. And he's absolutely right. He did a great job on some of the one read throws, you know, threw it to a wide open tight end. Great. Ended up throwing to a second wide open Again, tight end. Great. When they set him up when they set him up to be able to make that throw. Correct. Plays, the exact same plays that they were running earlier. And when he, and yeah. when he had to make some other decisions, he got sacked. Like that's Steve Angeli in a nutshell, like his entire career was right there in a nice little frame against Purdue. Like that's who he is. He can make some plays. 
and then he'll also frustrate the heck out of you and take sacks he shouldn't take. And, you know, Chris says he looked good. I would say he didn't look bad. Like, that would yeah, be my yeah. differentiation, you know? So, like, it's the sacks. Like, I did feel like there were times when he showed pretty good presence, out, you know, like in terms of pocket presence. But then, you know, like, like you talk about the difference between what you're going to get from Leonard and what you're going to get from Angeli, you know, no, Leonard hasn't hit those throws downfield yet. And we've talked this week about how he's been off just a little bit a couple of times. He got bumped by Knapp on that throw to Bo right. Collins. And obviously, he, you know, again, he hit great house in the hands against Northern Illinois and, and that kind of stuff. So he hasn't quite hit those connections just yet. But he's shown that he can make plays with his legs. Now, does he get out and, and maybe start taking off too soon sometimes? Sure. But the difference is, Steve Angeli, you know, there's a little bit of quicksand there that he's running in. Mm -hmm. Like if he even thinks about making those moves, he's got no move to elude that rush. And he got sacked three times in right. the second half. And, and Chris came back and he says, those were bad sacks. I agree, but I think it's easy to fix by throwing it away. That's the problem. He's in this, he's a third year guy. He should he's already be throwing, throwing it away. away. That's yeah. the problem. That in itself is the problem, Chris. That's exactly what he should have done. Yeah, that's, I mean, but that's a good point too. You got to remember, like, Riley Leonard is not a fifth year guy. He's only in his fourth year right now. He's people only keep one saying year. that he's in his fifth year. I've I've heard he's that not. from multiple, like, people in the media saying that he's in his fifth year. Like, no, he's not. He was not a I grad think, transfer, right? They assume that because of, yeah, you know, you know he came from the portal. Easy and all thing that. to check. This this is only his fourth year. He's a true senior. Right now, he played a handful of games as a true freshman, played a full season as a sophomore, and then the injuries partial season last year. This is only his fourth year. He's only a year ahead, uh, one year ahead of Steve Angeli right now. So, like, when you think about that in terms of development and who's done what and all that different kind of stuff. So, yeah. DK, just curious, did those sacks end those drives? I don't remember. Do you remember the answer to that? Uh, I've got my notebook. I, I, I stopped keeping. I stopped keeping track of the play-by-play. -play, uh, <laughs> That's in, a good point the, because I did too. Quarter, to be That's honest a good with point. you, so because it, it was it was it was know. to the point like, what's the purpose in any of this? Um, he was sacked on first and ten. That I've got written down here. And that was on Notre Dame's, I think it was their third drive. I'm looking at the second drive. And that's kind of where I stopped because it was, you know. I stopped in the end of the third quarter. So, yeah. Um, let's see. I've got the play-by-play -play here digitally, but it's probably going to take way too long to he find He did it. take off running, you know, the next play after that and got a pretty good gain. But, you know, again, like he had a wide open field because everybody else, it was like second and 20 after the sack. So everybody else was 30 yards downfield. You know? so. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, I, I'm going to have a hard time. Like I said, this is not great radio trying to look for when Steve Angeli was sacked. Um and why if it if it uh you know killed drives or whatever yeah cuz i'm honestly not sure josh is asking if technically riley leonard could play one more year he could not this no. is his fun because only if he ends up redshirting this year for an injury or something right. like, like that right like yeah. like if he would get injured right now or not play again for the rest of the year this could be his redshirt year but the the players, like the COVID year, anyone who's in their fifth year, like going into their fifth year right now, using the COVID year, like that was the final. Essentially, Riley Leonard came in a year too late to get the COVID year of eligibility, like right. the extra year of eligibility. Yep. So, yeah. So he could not, like, again, unless this was a year that he ended up redshirting, he could not play one more year. So which quarterback, Vince, will throw – a touchdown first this season, Riley Leonard or your favorite guy, Chicago Bears rookie, Caleb Williams. <laughs> uh, well, look, Riley Leonard gets to play a day before Williams, right? So I believe Williams is playing on Sunday. Yes. So if, if that's the case, then I'm going to go with Riley Leonard. I, I, I have to, I, I think I predicted this last week too. And obviously I was wrong. 
I, I just feel like he's going to get one this week. So I'm feeling it. It's going to yes. happen. It's going to happen this week. Yes. Feeling the vibe. That's what I'm hoping for. Now, I was calling anyway. it last week that there would be like a screen pass to Jeremiah Love, which I don't think ever really came, but like that was, I was calling screen pass Jeremiah Love, and that was going to be Riley Leonard's first touchdown pass of the season. Again, didn't happen, but I'm, 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 I'm feeling it. Touchdown pass coming. He gets his first one at Notre Dame Stadium this weekend. If not, he'll have four touchdown runs. So you've got that going for you. <laughs> Book it. <laughs> but yeah, but because he plays Saturday and Caleb Williams plays Sunday, I'm going to go with Riley. Yeah, it's a well. cop out answer, but that's what I'm going with. Yeah, that's because that, look, I think Riley Leonard's actually looked better than Caleb Williams as far as throwing the football, and that's saying a lot. So, well, cut him some slack. He is a rookie. Yeah, but he's doing the same things he was doing when they put pressure on him as a as a senior in college. Or whatever, that offensive line is horrible. College. Like I saw They're somebody awful. talking about it. They're but, awful. And I and, and I said this, and I know that you fall in love with wide receivers and all that kind of stuff, and it looks great. It's like, oh, we're going to take Caleb Williams one, and we're going to get Roma Dunze. The Bears have not drafted a high first round offensive lineman literally in at least twenty five years. Like, do yourself a favor. And draft a freaking left tackle for once, you know, draft a, a quality offensive lineman and help your quarterback that way. But that's not the way the Bears decided to do yeah. it. Doesn't matter who the GM is, they still go that direction. So fill in the blank. It's blank that Tennessee is upping ticket prices to all of its sports next year by 10% for what they call a talent fee on tickets to contribute to the revenue sharing plan that's going to begin next year. I honestly think it's a pretty good idea. If, if, if fans want you to spend the money, it's time to put your, put in a little piece of the pie. Like I, I really don't have a problem with that. I, I really don't. I mean, how are these schools, some of these schools supposed to pay for all the, the player acquisition that they're supposed to have? Like, I, I really don't have a problem with it. I don't either. And I'll be, somewhat surprised if you don't start seeing this across the power four. I mean, they're just getting out in front of the, like it's got to happen somewhere. But like, if you're going to start sharing the revenue with the players, then you have to find different ways to increase the revenue so that you're not taking as big a hit by sharing that revenue with, you know, players, student athletes, whatever you want to call them, but they've got to come up with it someplace and so who are you going to pass it along to you're going to pass it along to the fans and they've got a big stadium and they sell out all the time so i think it makes perfect sense yep. you know up your up your ticket prices a little bit as long as the demand is there people are going to pay it and you know again you know, like start there and i'm sure that they're going to you know continue to look at that you know other ways with sponsorships and stuff like that but everyone's got sponsorships right now so add a little bit to your ticket prices and yeah go that direction i'm not shocked not at all and i think it's actually a kind of an inventive way to uh raise some money i really like i said i have no problem with it yep PB Angeli, going back to the quarterbacks, he says, if there was a reward for being the worst evaluator of quarterback talent all time, I, I think it should go to Rees. Open terms of car, even a blind squirrel Look, sometimes finds a nut. The quarterbacks that were brought in prior to Brian Kelly leaving were Brian Kelly guys. And as Sloppy Joe aptly pointed out, BK picked Steve Angeli over Drew Aller. That was a Brian Kelly move. And as soon as Brian Kelly left, that is when Kenny Minchie came in. CJ Carr came in. Yep. Those are Reese guys. So if you like both of those guys, then you can't say Reese is a bad evaluator of talent. You can't have it both ways. He recruited those guys. They committed on his watch. So can't have it both ways. I Look, I know for a fact that Tommy Reese was hamstrung with who he was allowed to recruit under Brian Kelly. Yeah. Period. Yeah. So. Yep, there was a mold of what he was looking for, yeah. that's for sure. A certain way of doing things. And I think I think that we can all agree that that's that's in a better place now than yes. it was three years oh, ago. Oh, yeah, 100%. And now, look, since Reese left, they're still doing a great job 
you know, getting guys is, you know, with, with Gadouli and Denbrock and Freeman, I think they've, 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 you know, picked up the torch or the baton, whatever analogy you want to use, but uh, the quarterback recruiting has been in a good place uh, for the last, you know, three or four cycles. Scott, thank you very much for the reminder to everyone to hit that like button. We appreciate it. As always, Steven says he thinks Bean was better than Daniels for Kansas. Usually backup quarterbacks are worse, but sometimes unathletic backups are just ballers. I mean, Bean got better over time, you know, basically because he got more reps and he had some experience coming from, I think it was North Texas that he, that he came to Kansas from two years ago, the year TCU ended up going undefeated. That's when Daniels first got hurt toward the end of the first half of that game and what ended up being a, a one possession game right down to the wire. And like in that game specifically being through a couple of unfortunate interceptions that I think if Daniels is in that game, Kansas probably wins that game and TCU never ends up playing in the national championship game. And we don't have to see the most lopsided national championship game that we've seen so far. I think the biggest thing with Daniels is just, he hasn't been able to stay healthy. And I think that, yeah. He's showing a lot of rust from sitting out with the back injury that he had all last year. But I mean, Bean played Bean played better than I thought he would last year. But again, I felt like he got better with as he got more yeah. reps over time. One more question here tonight. Fill in the blank. It's blank that the Pittsburgh Penguins have players hand deliver season tickets to the season ticket holders. I think it's freaking awesome. Like that is so old school, by the way, just like actual like person to person, you know, interaction, you know, and you're spending all kinds of money on season tickets. Honestly, that's the least they can do is have some players deliver that stuff. I think it's yeah. freaking cool, man. I dig it. I think Before, it's really cool for professional athletes to be going door yeah. to door delivering wearing their the jerseys and like, yeah. the whole, like, I think that's freaking awesome. Yeah, it's a pretty cool deal and i know like you know muffet used to do that with women's basketball she you know they would go out and handle i'm not sure if niel still does that or not i can't like i'm not saying she doesn't but i know that you know like muffet did it but the fact that you've got professional yeah. athletes i think more especially in the smaller markets where yes. you need that kind of connection i think more teams should do that get your players and go you know even if you're going to do you know like they do fan fest and some mm -hmm. stuff even if you're not going to go door to door like put on a little event and invite the season ticket yeah. holders and you've got your players there and they get to, you know, like hand them out to them. Yeah, when they I've get got there. Joe Smith, you know, and then you like, you get a little photo op with Joe and yeah. his family and that kind of stuff. I think it's awesome. I, I, I do understand that it can be, I mean, Pittsburgh's not a small area either. So it's, I'm sure it's a lot of season tickets to hand out and all that, yeah. but yeah, you know, just that little touch, man. I, I think it's it's awesome because you know the the fans are now going to identify with some of those players. Like he's the one that came to my house, you know, and right. root him on. And I, I just think it's really cool. Yep, I do too. And I, I saw some of this on social media the other day. It was like, oh, yeah, good, good, good on the Penguins and good use of social media. You know, like to be able to kind of show what you're doing there, doing that kind of stuff. I thought it was really cool. Right. All right. Well, I think that's <laughs> going to do it for tonight, Vince. I think we covered quite a bit. I think this is great from DK. <laughs> IB should hand deliver my mug and T-shirt. I agree. Who I think says that, you get a mug and T-shirt? I, I, he's a part of the Gold Club or what? Ah. I forget all the breakdowns, but they get special like IB Club, you know, mug and a T-shirt right. or something like that. So I agree. I think you need to uh, you need to send that right up the chain to the boss man. I think he needs to be delivering stuff to you. I think you're right. I think you're right. I would. Hey, look, if you guys are all because, you know, we've got people all over the country. We got some people, you know, obviously north of the border. If the boss wants to foot the bill, I got spring break coming up. I will be yeah. more than happy to deliver some stuff. Yeah, we do I'm a little road it. trip. Go yeah. and deliver some stuff. If, be you know, as long as paying the motels and the gas yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Why not get in the old RV we've been trying to get forever? <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> When's that going to happen? By <laughs> we the way? still got to work on that, man. <laughs> I know. This year is not going to work, obviously, because there's really no good game for that. I think Purdue is probably the best game for that. Mm -hmm. But uh, I still think we should do it for Lambeau. Still got my eye on that. Okay. 2026. I've scattered, like, done a little pre scouting. I know they've, okay. from what I understand, they've got an RV lot up there. So that's all I'm saying. 
could be fun. I'm saying needs to happen. And we can, we can have, uh, you know, Tommy be our driver. It's a professional driver. I trust him. (laughs) That's a good idea. That's a good idea. Although, you know, like getting into like sleeping in close quarters with, you know, like, is he a snorer? Is he? Oh, Tommy, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, Like a lot of unknowns there. Yeah. It's a good point. Like I did an overnight once. This has been a long time ago with someone I used to work with a couple. And it's like, I didn't realize that I wasn't going to be able to sleep all night because you snore. (laughs) Yeah. That's rough. That's rough. Someone you know, by the way. And I'm sure it is. I, I I think I know exactly who it is, but I will I got another story for you when we get out of here. So Oh, okay. Yep. I love it when you tease the off air stuff and you just tick off the listeners as to what it is we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about you. That's what we're gonna do. What? What? Not you, them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's going to do it for tonight. Appreciate you. As always, we'll have some of uh, Marcus Freeman's noon Zoom comments on the show tomorrow. And it's also We In, We Out Day on Thursday's show. So if you haven't done so already, head to the new Champions Lounge, post your questions there, and we will have them on tomorrow's show. We will talk to you then. I've been Asian Sports Talk.